Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity again of coming before you. We're asking that you open up the pages of the scriptures to our hearts and understanding. And Lord, as we read and study these things, we pray that the effect it had on the early days upon your people, it will have the same effects upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray that as we come in your, into your presence, your hand will touch us and change us. And you will prepare us for the task ahead. When the Holy Ghost came upon your people in the early days of the church, it filled them with power and boldness. Father, we're asking that the same today will happen to us. That more than anything and more than any other time, your power will be in our lives. Your boldness will be in our lives. And we'll be able to declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ everywhere we are in power and in boldness. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We're in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Already we have seen how the Lord worked in sending his angel to Cornelius. And he heard from, from the angel that he was to send to Joppa, where he'll be able to get at Peter, who then will bring the full gospel message he needed to hear to him. On the other hand, God was working in the life of Peter, he too received a vision, and we have studied how the Holy Ghost himself explained and interpreted the vision to him. Now at last, Peter and Cornelius met together. You must understand that at this time, God had worked on both ends, that the heart of Peter had been prepared for the task ahead of him. For him, it was a first experience a first experience of coming into the Gentiles or keeping company with the Gentiles. I told you before that the Gentiles and the Jews had nothing in common. And I told you that the Gentiles felt that the Jews were just materials for slavery because the Roman people were Gentiles and they were ruling at that time over the world and over the Jews as well. On the other hand, the Jews were feeling that the Gentiles were just fuel for the fire of hell. There was great hatred, prejudice between them. And um, the Lord had worked on the side of Cornelius the centurion, the leader of the Italian band. And he had collected his household together and his friends and relatives. And according to what we studied last week, he said, Now therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God? The Lord had prepared his own heart and the hearts of the household. On the side of Peter too, the Lord had prepared his heart. And he came, he was now going to address them. Today we see both the message and the manifestation. The simple message coming from Peter to this assembly and then the supernatural manifestation coming from heaven not only to confirm the message but to confirm and to reward the faith of the people. Let's read as we look at Acts chapter 10 verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of the truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and walketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Now how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things 
which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Let's stop there. Now, the assembly was waiting, and here Peter came. And it says in verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth. Well, perhaps you say, wouldn't he have to open his mouth? He was going to talk. What's strange in that? Why do we have to have that in the Bible? Anybody that ever spoke anything would have to open his mouth. But you understand, in the New Testament especially, whenever you are going to address a congregation and you are going to say something very weighty and very heavy and very indispensable, something that their lives hung upon. The writers in the New Testament will preface it by saying he opened his mouth. That is, he was not just in casual conversation. He was going to tell them something weighty and something heavy and their life, life here and life beyond, depended on what he was going to say. And then he said, of a truth, I perceive. Of a truth, I can see. Now you see, this was a Jew finding himself for the first time standing before gentle congregation. And he knew that there had been terrible hatred between the Jews and the Gentiles. And there was nothing that could bring them together for any reason whatever, except the power of God, except the grace of God, except the cross of Calvary, except the love of God. And Peter, as he looked at them, and he looked at himself, and he saw the six people that came with him from Joppa, sitting in the same congregation. What a sight. Jews and Gentiles speaking to, uh, sitting together, listening to the same word of God together. The cross bringing them together, breaking down the middle wall of partition. And now, as Peter saw that, and as Peter saw himself, a real Jew who had uh, previously said, nothing unclean had ever entered into my mouth. That is, I've been living and walking by the laws of the Jews, and I don't think I'm ever going to change. And as he looked at his past life, his own prejudices, and as he looked at his own uh, reservations in the past, and here he was, standing up before the Gentiles, and six Jews sitting also with them, he said, I perceive. Now I understand that the Jews and the Gentiles are brought together by God. The middle wall of partition is broken down. And those of us who have been feeling against one another, you said we are just for slavery. We said you are just for the fires of hell. And here we are together at the feet of Jesus. Now I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, Cornelius, did you tell me you saw an angel? We Jews didn't ever feel that a Gentile could see an angel. We didn't know there was ever mercy. Now we felt we had the monopoly of the word of, the, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the discerning of spirits. But did you tell me that the Spirit of God sent an angel and he revealed to you supernaturally that uh, he told you my name and my address and where you will find me and told you that I was a preacher, told you everything about me. You saw an angel, a gentile seeing an angel and uh, a gentile getting into all these gifts and having revelation from heaven. Now I can see that in every nation and it doesn't matter whether they are gentiles or Jews. By the very manifestation of what God has done, I can see that in every nation he that feareth him and walketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, Peter was getting into this revelation 
Now you must understand, Jesus told them before he went away, I have a lot of things to tell you, many things to tell you, but you cannot understand them now. How be it when the Spirit comes, he will reveal all things to you. And the Spirit has come. And step by step, a point at a time, the Spirit of God was revealing to them. And as the Spirit of God was revealing to them, they were following step by step. And now Peter could see it, that in every nation, in every nation, you know, they felt before, salvation is of the Jews. They felt before, we saw one casting out devils, and he is not one of us, and we forbade him. They felt before that all those Gentiles in Samaria who will not allow Jesus Christ to pass through, will you allow us to call fire down from heaven and burn them up? But now they could see that God is no respecter of persons, but that in every nation. He that fears God, he doesn't have to be a Jew, he doesn't have to be circumcised, he doesn't have, a, a, you know, to be able to speak the shibboleth. He doesn't have to be able to uh, say what they said, the way they said it, and get into their culture. But if he will fear God and walk righteousness, he'll be accepted of him. And actually, was this a new truth? Think about it. Abimelech was not in the lineage of um, Abraham. And yet, in the innocency of his own hand, he had gone out to take the wife of Abraham. And he didn't know it was wrong at all. And this man did not have a revelation of the Almighty before the time. What happened? The Lord came to him in a dream by night and said, Abimelech, you are a dead man by now because the person you have is another man's wife. What does that show? That shows if a person fears God and works righteousness, the Lord will show him more light. If he will walk in the light that he has received. Haven't you found, haven't you read about Rahab of the Gentiles? When those spies came and uh, Rahab said, I fear God. I know the Lord has given you the land. Have mercy upon me and upon my father's house. What is that proving to us? God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter from which nation a man or a woman may be. The Lord will show mercy if the heart of that person is panting after God, seeking after God. Haven't you read about Ruth of the Moabites? And you know Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to go from following after thee. Because where you lodge, I will lodge. Your God will be my God. Your people shall be my people. And that Moabitess was brought into the commonwealth of Israel. And she became a partaker, even in the lineage of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And you can see that all over the generations, he that calls after God, he that is seeking after God, he will be acceptable in the sight of God. Now in the New Testament, was this the first time a Gentile will seek after the Lord? Don't you remember? That centurion, another centurion at the time of Jesus, he had a servant sick. And he came to the Lord Jesus Christ to come and heal a servant. And Jesus said, I'll be coming. And he said, you don't have to come, a gentle, a centurion. And he said, speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus said, I didn't find a face like this, no, not in Israel. But I find the great faith, the greater faith, out of Israel. This man is not a Jew, just a gentle. Be it unto you according to your faith. What is that? God is no respecter of persons. One of those days, uh, you know, that Shirophoenician woman who came from the coasts of Tyre and Sidon, he came to the Lord and he said, O oh Lord, be merciful unto me. My daughter is grievously vexed of the devil. What did Jesus say? He kept quiet. And, the, gen and uh, uh, the Jews, the disciples, they looked at her, a gentle woman, and he said, drive her away. She's making a noise after us. And that woman came and said, have mercy upon me. And uh, Jesus said, uh, I wasn't sent except to the house of Israel. But then that woman came near and said, be merciful unto me. And Jesus looked at her and said, woman, it is not fit to give the children's bread unto dogs. That woman was a gentle. And she said, truth, Lord. Those children of the kingdom are not taking it. But you give me the crumbs that have fallen from the table. And that shows that if a gentile will persist, if a gentile will be persevering, if a gentile will know that the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent takes it by force, that gentile can press in into that kingdom. And Jesus looked at her and said, Oh woman, 
great is your faith. Great is your faith. Be it unto you as thou, as, as thou wilt. And the daughter was made whole. You remember at the cross, while Jesus Christ was hanging there, there was a centurion that looked at the whole thing. And when that centurion saw the darkness and the storm and the thunder and heard about uh, the veil in the temple being rent into two, he said of a truth, this is the very son of God. A Gentile. You remember when Philip was in the revival in Samaria that there was another Gentile from Ethiopia who had come to Jerusalem to worship and while he was coming back and the Holy Ghost uh, through that angel just said uh, you join yourself with this chariot and uh, he said do you understand what you read? He said how can I understand? Except some man should guide me and Philip preached the gospel to that Gentile and when they got to the place where there was water he said here is water what hinders me to be baptized? He said, if you believe with all your heart, he said, I do. I do. I believe that, that Jesus is the Son of God. And he was baptized in water. And he went his way rejoicing. Another Gentile had known the truth, the gospel light, and another Gentile was saved. What does that show? It shows this. That of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Have we perceived it? That in every nation, in every denomination as well, deeper life or no deeper life, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anywhere, everywhere. Have you perceived it that God is no respecter of persons? That in every nation, in every home, in every tribe, in every locality, whatever name they are called, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord in the acceptable way as revealed in the scriptures, he too will have the mercy of God. Peter discovered it. And now, as he discovered it, he showed that God is an impartial God. That had been in the scriptures all along, from all the references and all the examples and illustrations I've shown you about Gentiles coming into the knowledge of the truth. In um, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great and a, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Far back in the day of Moses, we have been assured that God is no respecter of persons. In Second Chronicles chapter 19, and I'm reading there in verse 7, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. Now telling us that at any time, in whatever age, the Lord will have mercy. Now you want to understand this, that the children of Israel were given light, not to monopolize the light, but to, mani to manifest the light. They were not given the light to become separatists, but to become missionaries. The Lord was going to reach out to the world through them. The world, the world was to have the knowledge of the Lord filled with the, uh, uh, the earth or to be filled with the knowledge of God. But they thought it made them better, put them on a special platform and put them in a separate class and they were just to be separated from the people. Oh yes, they were to be separated from their idolatry, from their evil, from their immorality, from their sins. They were to be separated from the false religions, but then their lives were to show light, and their lives were to give out the gospel, the things they were given to other people. And if they would have no noticed uh, all the patriots, they would have understood that the Lord wanted whatever he gave them to influence other people. Think about it. God called Abraham. Didn't some Gentiles, some people who are not in the lineage of Abraham, did they not benefit from what the Lord gave him? Of course they did. You remember that he even delivered uh, um, the people that had been taken captive from Sodom. And then uh, Melchizedek came to him, the king of Salem, 
and told him, Blessed be God who has given you such victory. And the king of Sodom, even the king of Sodom, had the opportunity of coming across that, um, that Abraham to see the power of God in his life. And as the children of Israel were passing through the wilderness, didn't Balak and Balaam, didn't they know they were not of the line of Israel? And yet God opened the eyes of Balaam and he said, I see that star coming. A star that will arise out of Jacob. You know, when the Lord gave the, the truth, the word to the children of Israel, it was not for monopoly. It was for them to reach out with that light so that the rest of the people in the world, they will have the gospel, they will have the truth that God had given them. And you can see in the life of uh, Moses, as Moses went away from Egypt and he came to Jethro, was Jethro an Israelite? No, sir. But then the light came unto him. In fact, he sent to him later and he said, come along with us. Come along with us. Because God has promised things good concerning his own people. Think about all the, all the prophets. Think about Joshua. Think about Elijah. Think about Elisha. Think about the people you find in the Old Testament. There was a way that God made the avenue or the channel that the truth they had will come to the Gentiles. And Hosea was very bold and he said, the people that have not called me, they'll find me. Meaning that all these Gentiles, the light of the gospel will shine. And then Isaiah said the same thing, Jeremiah said the same thing, many of the prophets said the same thing. It wasn't anything strange at all that God was planning that the truth of the word of God will come to every nation. But those disciples, because of the prejudice that had been planted in them from early childhood, they didn't get it in time. But now Peter at last got it and he said, now I perceive it. That God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, the person that fears God and walks righteousness will be accepted by him. In Job chapter 34, verse 19, how much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regarded the rich more than the poor, for they all are the work of his son. They all are the work of his son. In Romans chapter 2, verse 11. Romans chapter 2, verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. If that is so, we who are children of God must also understand there, is no res there should be no respect of persons with God's own people. With the children of God in James chapter 2, reading from verse 1. James chapter 2. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. My brethren, this God is impartial, and the Lord Jesus Christ, He died for all, and this Holy Ghost will move anything on earth to be able to move the hearts of men and all men. And therefore, if the Godhead is not partial, and the Godhead is no respecter of persons, we too have come into the Lord and we have received the light of the gospel. We should not have the face of Christ with respect of persons. In verse 2, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, the fine clothing. And say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there. Or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and have become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom? which he has promised to them that love him, but he, ye have despised the poor. Do not the rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme the worthy name by, by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well, but if ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin. And are convinced of the law, as transgressors. Now, 
Peter the apostle had uh, made us to understand not that now he could perceive. And uh, hopefully we too will have perceived that everywhere in the whole world, in all nations, and in every denomination, people who are really willing to call on God, willing to give their lives to the Lord, and are willing to come to terms and conditions with the word of God, they will be acceptable in the sight of God. Now, let's see in Acts chapter 10. In verse 36, he now gives uh, the message. And this was a simple message. And um, if you have noticed uh, Peter the Apostle ministering, I've told you before the ministry of these men of God. There were times that he ministered as an evangelist. I told you that an apostle will have uh, all the other gifts uh, manifesting in his life. Check up uh, those people you have as apostles. They manifested the prophetic ministry. They, they also had an evangelistic outreach. They were also having the pastoral ministry. And of course, they were teachers of the world. All the gifts just headed up or culminated in them. And so there were times we'll see an apostle when it comes to people that have never heard the gospel. He gets into the ministry of the evangelist. And here, uh, they say he was going to get into the ministry because he had never met these people. He didn't know what experience they had. Oh yes, he knew that this man, according to his testimony, had seen an angel, and the angel had spoken to him. But Peter will not take for granted, and he must go over the basics of the gospel truth again. And uh, if you have noticed Peter, any time that he came near or he came across a new audience, he was going to go through the basics. That Peter, you should study his messages. He had a way of repeating himself without losing the anointing. You know, there are people that repeat themselves, but uh, they almost annoy you. They almost uh, make you feel, but he said that before. Doesn't he have another thing to say? You'll say, well, I thought he was uh, going to say another thing, but it's still the same thing. But have you noticed uh, Peter? He preached it in chapter 2, he preached it in chapter 3, he preached it in chapter 4, he said it in chapter 5, and you know, every time he came across a new audience as an evangelist, he knew that there are some basic evangelistic truths that must be there in every message. Well, the introduction may be different, the structure may be different, the conclusion may be different, but the basic truth about Christ, about his death, about his suffering, about his burial, about his resurrection must be in the message of the evangelist. And Peter had a wonderful way of repeating himself without becoming monotonous, without becoming repulsive, and without lacking anointing. And here, he repeated himself. Now, evangelists do that a lot. One, because uh, they know that every sinner needs the gospel message. And the sinners they preached all last year or last month or last week, and now they have been saved and other people are doing the follow-up. And now they come to a new set of people they have never heard. And um, the gospel is good news. Listen to me. It is good if it comes in time. It is news if, if they have never heard it. And it is good news if the people can understand and um, understand this. The preacher ought to be a tree of life with branches and fruits hanging down low enough for the youngest person in the audience to be able to just reach up his hand and pluck the fruit. But you know, when the evangelist or the preacher is such a tree of knowledge, not a tree of life, but a tree of knowledge, and he's so tall, and you need a dictionary to be able to pluck the fruit of the message of salvation from what he's saying. That theologian has gone beyond a stage of usefulness before the people. But the branches should be low enough so that the children and the, ch and the uh, low people and those who have never heard will not have to go and take a dictionary or uh, a commentary from somewhere or an interpreter of languages uh, to be able to tell them what you are saying as an evangelist. And that is why an evangelist should just keep himself simple and basic. And Peter did it marvelously. And so you can see from what he was saying, uh, see it in verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Preaching peace by Jesus Christ. That is, this Jesus Christ is our peace. 
I will never be able to have peace with God until we meet this Jesus Christ. Neither will we have peace with ourselves, with one another, until we meet Jesus Christ. Neither shall we even have peace within ourselves until we meet the Lord. Threefold peace. And man is at, uh, is at enmity with himself. And the heart of man, the conscience of man is troubling him so much. There is no peace. In the night he cannot sleep. In the day he cannot sleep. He's at war with himself. And uh, his conscience is his greatest enemy. There is guilt and there is confusion. And the apostle uh, Peter was saying, Now we have been preaching peace. The people can have peace of mind. If you just know the Lord Jesus Christ, then you understand that after you have got peace in yourself, and peace with God, we are reconciled with God, the enmity is broken down, because when we were enemies of God, Christ came as a mediator, and he handled our hand, and handled the hand of God, and he brought everything together, and looked at the face of the Father, and said, for my sake, for sa uh, forgive him. And also, the sinner looked at the face of God, and he pointed to Jesus again, the mediator, for his sake, forgive me. And then he joined the sinner's hand with the hand of the supreme God in heaven. And he became a child of God. Now he has peace with God. He is reconciled with God. All that came through the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only that. The Jews on the one hand, they have been brought to peace with God through Jesus. And the Gentiles on the other hand now have been brought with peace, in, uh, peace with God through the same Jesus Christ. You know what will happen? they too will be at peace with themselves. Picture two people fighting together. And they will not uh, listen to anybody. They just fought and fought, wanted to destroy one another. And then um, a friend came. This person is a friend to number one, also a friend to number two, a friend to both of them. And then he held their hands and talked with them. And because they were his friends, they would listen to him. He brought them together. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And then the Jews have now come to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gentiles are now coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gentiles and the Jews that will not see one another's face before. Jesus now has brought them together. Jesus is our peace. Haven't you found that in our society before? The two people who have sworn they'll never greet one another. They'll never have anything to do with one another. One became a believer, the other became a believer. They met in the church, they saw one another, and perhaps they were going to meet at the communion table. They were going to partake of the body of the Lord and the blood of the Lord, the wine and the bread. And then just before then, they saw one another with tears on their eyes saying, forget it, forget it. Don't let us worry about who is guilty and who is right. Forget it. Jesus is our peace. And they go to the Lord's table together as brothers, as sisters, as friends, as children of the same kingdom. That is what Jesus does. And Peter was explaining to the people the word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word I say, ye know. Now Peter didn't feel that these people were totally ignorant. He said, that word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from, G from Galilee after the baptism of which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, uh, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things. Now, look up here. Preachers, you know, it's wonderful to study how the people preached in the New Testament. It's wonderful. Uh, you know, if I were, I don't know about you, if I was, the moment I began to talk on how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, that word anointing may fascinate me, attract me. 
and I may just go on telling the people all about anointing, the anointing upon Moses, the anointing upon Elijah, the double anointing upon Elisha, the anointing of the prophets, and the anointing of the present day, and the anointing that is promised to the children of God. You know, if you were, don't you think you could do that? But Peter will not, because he wanted to present the gospel, the simple gospel, unto them. And he just mentioned that in passing to introduce Jesus Christ unto them. So as to make sure that if they never heard any other thing, they heard about this. And then he said, he went about doing good. Now preacher, zonal leader, area leader. Now we've given you an outline, the house fellowship outline. And the real outline is not talking about healing. The outline may be talking about another basic truth. But a verse was quoted that relates to healing. Healing all that are oppressed of the devil. Haven't you sometimes made mistake? And now leaving the rest of the outline and just stay there and talk about healing. Healing in the old covenant, healing in the new covenant, healing through Christ, healing through the word, healing through the atonement, healing through the spirit, the indwelling spirit, and he just went on on healing. But you know, Peter, he was a spirit controlled man. He knew where he was going, he knew his target, and he was going to aim at the target. What a lesson to us that when you have the tendency and the temptation to just branch aside into another, into another um, topic, even though that topic may be legitimate and profitable in its place, but if that is not a word that outline is meant for, and if, you, if the Spirit of God is not taking over to just uh, give the word to the people, you better stick to what you had in mind before. As fellowship leader, that you know that outline is in your hand, and then you come across a passage that says uh, women should dress in modest apparel. Oh yes, I've been waiting for that verse all my life. And then you leave the rest of the outline and you like to talk about Christian dressing. Come back to the outline. Stay with the outline. You know, Peter said how God anointed this Jesus of Nazareth. Because he was talking about Jesus Christ and he wanted to reveal about his power. He wanted to reveal about the anointing upon him. But then he must move on to talk about the death, about the burial, about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 39 he said, And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. You know what he's saying? He's saying, um, Gentiles. I know that many people might have come to you to confuse you and to talk about that Jesus Christ and you have had many ideologies and many uh, opposing ideas about Jesus Christ but Cornelius did you tell me an angel sent uh, to, to ask you to come and call me and that I have the word in my mouth now this is the word I was a witness all those people who are talking to you about Jesus Christ and they are talking rubbish and they are, they are not sure of his death, of his burial, of his resurrection. We are witnesses of all things, both what he did in the land of the Jews and also in Jerusalem, whom they slew and they hanged on the tree, whom God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Of course, not to all the people, but unto us, the witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Of course, Peter knew that these Gentiles, when, when he mentioned the rising from the dead, they might say, huh, that's spooky. That's a ghost. Because, you know, many superstitious stories uh, among the Gentiles, it's in our land here as well. You know, people say, they see that ghost, they see that ghost. And the moment Peter mentioned that he rose from the dead and we saw him, well, he didn't know what questions would be in their mind. He said, we ate with him, we drank with him, after he rose from the dead. And uh, not only that, you know, many people, they like to uh, just stay with their testimonies. Uh, let me ask you, if you saw Jesus Christ, a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you are one of those people that ate with him and drank with him, and you came to that point and you said, we drank with him, we ate with him, oh, let me describe to you how it was. Beautiful experience, wonderful experience. You know, we just sat down there and we ate, you described the food, you described the time of the day. No, that was not the issue. The issue is preach the gospel to them. 
And because this was a time of presenting the gospel, he must keep with what he was saying. And he just passed on. He just mentioned that we drank with him, we ate with him to confirm that actually, you know, he rose from the dead. And then he said, he commanded us. He moved on. And my brother, my sister, when the opportunity comes to you to preach the gospel, move on. Don't just stay on one point and, you know, on a wonderful point, on a point of testimony, how you came to the Lord, how you saw the vision, how you saw the glory, how you saw this and you saw that. Well, if God wants to mention it in person, you may, but give the message, move on. Preach the good news and let the people know the source of their salvation. Let the people know the basis of their salvation. Let the people know the possibility of the remission of the removal of their sin. And he said he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he, no other one. It is he which was ordained of God to judge the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness. Not only my word, not only the word of the apostles, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth shall receive the remission of sins. Well, Peter, what do you think about these people? Are they saved? Well, I don't know. What do you think about them? This congregation you are preaching to, are they sanctified? Well, I'm sorry, I don't know. Why don't you talk to them about sanctification? No, I think I should just talk to them about uh, being born again, about Jesus Christ, because I don't know what they know, and I don't know what they don't know. What a lesson for us. If you don't know what the people know, the safest thing to do is to talk on the basic truth. The safest thing to do is to talk about salvation, about the new birth, about Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, and the Savior. Except you have time to find out by interviewing some of the people, except you have time to find out if, it, if that is not your regular congregation. If you are just a new person in a locality, you are sent out, maybe to an African country, you are sent out maybe to a local government area in Nigeria here, or you go to your village and some people said, you know, we love the Lord, here we are, we are gathered together, we want to hear the word of God, and you have not had time to look at their lives, listen to their testimonies, know whether they are born again or not, you don't know whether they are sanctified or not, even if they are saved, even if they are sanctified, what is the best thing for you to do if you don't know about their spiritual state? Talk about salvation again. That same old story. He said, forever new. It's forever new. And it doesn't matter if you talk about sal salvation and the people need sanctification. If their faith will hold on to the word you are saying, God will sanctify them. If they're already sanctified and uh, you are just talking about salvation and you want to, you know, go from this point to that point to that point, the Lord can fill them with the Holy Ghost. Now, as he was talking, look at verse 44. Here comes the supernatural manifestation. Before you look at that verse, let me tell you this. If you are called of God, God will confirm that call from above. Peter was called of God to come into the house of Cornelius. God confirmed it from above. It wasn't because he said something so deep, so great, so high, so novel, so marvelous. No, it was just the basic, simple truth of the gospel. But because he was called of God, called of God, the Lord confirmed that word from above and he gave the Holy Ghost to them. What a lesson to us. If you, are, you know, if you say that uh, God has called you and you preach and preach and preach and the doctrine seems to be correct and the doctrine seems to be straight lined, old fashioned, wonderful and yet there is no confirmation from above, you should check up. Don't just keep on preaching, preaching and preaching if there is no confirmation from above. Now he was uh, preaching and as he went on, not six people that came with Peter. What a confirmation in their heart. That while Peter yet spake, these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Which heard the word. He didn't have time to lay hands on them. That is appropriate and that is proper in its place. Although the Bible says, lay hands suddenly on no man. 
so that you are not just going about uh, to people, uh, say, no, yes, if I lay my hands on you, you are going to get the Holy Ghost. You don't know the people. You don't know the people. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And uh, if there are people in the areas, in the zones, who are saying, oh yes, I'm only an area leader, but God has given me the power. If I lay hands on anybody, he will have the Holy Ghost. Good luck unto you. You go and lay hands on people having uh, familiar spirits. Because they are not using jewelry. <laughs> because they are wearing a, a sister's garment. You go and lay hands on them. And you can teach them how to speak in tongues. Good luck to you. You know, there are some people that are trotting about and going about from one zone to the other. And they're saying, oh yes, I am a, just an area leader, but God has given me special anointing, special anointing. And, uh, you know, I just go about, uh, last week I was at Trulere Zone, the other week at, uh, I was at Ikoyi Zone, the other week I was at Ajegule Zone. And, uh, you know, I have come now, lucky people have come to your zone, the prophet of the age. He has come. And let everybody come out now. And uh, it doesn't matter who you are, if I lay my hands on you, you are going to get the Holy Ghost poor man he doesn't know the ways of the spirit he has never seen those people he has never known those people and instead of confirming the word of salvation unto them instead of confirming the truth of God line upon line he will not do it and all he's doing from one zone to the other is collecting people into night vigil for, uh, for ministering Holy Ghost to them I hope you people understand the Bible more than that. I hope you people will not allow anybody to deceive you and cajole you into a uh, come and receive the Holy Ghost without being saved, without being sanctified, without being purified in your heart. And somebody will tell you, there's a shortcut somewhere. Come on, let's just uh, let's receive this thing. And then you he begins to teach you. Peter did not teach the people how to speak in tongues. But you know, there are assemblies like that. And there are groups like that. And maybe there is somebody who is a, a so-called deeper life a member that has come to you and he has said, have you got the Holy Ghost? And you say, well, I'm just praying about it. Ah, ah, it doesn't take time. Okay, te give me 10 minutes. You'll speak in tongues. You better run away from him. That's one of the people Jesus spoke about that in the last days false prophets will come. And then he tells you, he says, I kneel down. Now, don't speak English. Don't speak English. And then he says, oh, Father, we thank you. That you are going to give this man the Holy Ghost. Sir, is he saved? No, don't worry, don't worry. God is all powerful. Don't let anything bring doubt into your heart. Have you known your restitution? Oh, no, don't talk about restitution. Don't, don't bring unbelief. And then he says, uh, then as, uh, as he prays, he says, now you have got it, you have got it. Speak after me. And he begins to say, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Faster and faster. Say it, say it, say it. Don't, don't waste time. And the other person begins to say, and then begins to say, bata, bata, bata. And then the other person too begins to repeat after, aha, you have got it, you have got it. And then he goes to another zone. And then he says, uh, ah, <laughs> 10 minutes ago, I've just uh, given, he's the one now giving the Holy Ghost, no more God. I've just given the Holy Ghost to somebody. Now I'm going to give it to you now. <laughs> A poor man. That's not the way of the Spirit. Don't commercialize the Holy Ghost. Let the people, let the Lord himself prepare them. And you know, while Peter was just speaking, the Lord knew that their hearts were ready. And because their hearts were ready, all of them, Cornelius and the friends and the neighbors, all the people that were inside there, their hearts were just looking up to God. They had reached the high point of faith. And the Lord knew that they were ready at that time to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And while Peter was yet speaking, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which had the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gifts of the, the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they, they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they prayed him, they begged him, uh, they, and then prayed they him to tarry certain days. They said, now we've got the Holy Ghost, tarry with us. Uh, we know that you have not finished your sermon. Now we've got the Holy Ghost, continue preaching. 
Have you ever seen people who have got the Holy Ghost? That's what they say they have got. They have spoken in tongues. The fire is now all over them. The revelation has come to them. And you know, they don't come to Monday Bible study anymore. And you ask them, uh, hey, why don't you come to Monday Bible study anymore? Oh, I've gone beyond that thing you call Monday Bible study. Monday Bible study. I used to come before I received the Holy Ghost. But when the Holy Ghost came upon me, I graduated from Bible study. Now you find somebody who before was very zealous and he will come on Monday, he will come on Thursday, he will come on Sunday and you don't even find him in Sunday worship anymore and you say, uh, sister, what's the matter? We don't find you anymore at the Sunday uh, worship. Oh, <laughs> you're expecting me there? It's good for you people who have just started but you know I've gone beyond all that. Because now, the Holy Ghost is with me, and I've spoken in tongues, and the power of God is mighty upon my life. You go and invite other people who are not like me. As for me, I am now a specially anointed person. You know, that's how some people get lost. But you know, these people received the Holy Ghost. And then they were baptized in water. And then they, they were begging Peter. They were saying, you have not finished. You have not finished. We know that you are still talking. You have not said, let us pray before the Holy Ghost came upon us. You must stay certain days and teach us all the rest that you still have to teach us. Do you know when you are saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost, it is then you will start learning the word of God. Your being baptized in the Holy Ghost will not make you graduate and say, I don't need it anymore. You'll just continue to learn on the word of God. I pray that God will give us such a humble spirit, such a humble attitude, so that whatever experience we have, we shall be willing still to assemble with the children of God and sit to listen to the word of God. Rise up and let us pray. Tell the Lord about your life. You've heard the gospel. If you are not saved, give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for you. He rose up for your justification. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you are saved, you are not sanctified, you can tell the Lord, Oh Lord, here am I. Purify me, cleanse me, purge me. And the Lord will do it. And if you have been sanctified, you want the Lord to fill you, to overflow him, to baptize you with the Holy Ghost, he will do it. Call upon the Lord. And if you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, this is the time to settle down to learn the Word of God. To learn more of what those who are appointed to teach you, what they have to teach. And if you may be going about from zone to zone, causing confusion. Telling people that you give the Holy Ghost, you better repent of it. Give your heart to the Lord. If your heart is seeking after God, you tell the Lord you're seeking after Him. And if you are not saved yet, you are not born again yet, you are not free from sin yet, you tell the Lord, have mercy upon me. The Lord will do it. It will save you and take sin away from your life.